Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and this is module 5 on heredity. We're getting close to the end now, I've only got a few more videos to go. This is number 27 on single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. So we've shifted across now into a look at um, population genetics and this particular um, video is focusing in on some uh, the analysis of some single nucleotide polymorphisms um, and how they might relate to population genetics. So what we want you to do is to be able to define that term, single nucleotide polymorphism, um, to describe the formation and importance of these, these particular phenomena and also to see if we can evaluate their efficacy or their efficiency um, for population frequency studies. So I guess the first important question is what is an SNP? What is a single nucleotide polymorphism? Well hopefully when you see these sorts of complex terms you can start to split them up a little bit so you uh, understand a little bit more or at least some components of this. Okay so I'm not going to discuss single because that should be straightforward. Um, nucleotides we should also be uh, pretty straightforward now too. We've uh, had quite a look at the structure of DNA. We know that DNA is a twisted spiral um, uh, with double strand and that those double strands consist of individual units which we call nucleotides and each nucleotide is made up of a sugar, a phosphate and a nitrogenous base. Those bases are A's, T's, G's and C's in uh, DNA. So we're talking about a single nucleotide, okay, that's good. So we've kind of got that uh, set. Now what about polymorphism? Now polymorphism is a term that you will come up uh, against uh, more than once in your biology course. Uh, poly, hopefully, um, you, you'd be aware of um, from mass as much as from science. Uh, poly means many, lots, polymers, um, polygons. And morphism is form or structure, so lots of different shapes or forms for single nucleotides. So, okay, different, many different forms of single nucleotides. Well, we know there's four different types, um, ones that have A's, ones that have T's, ones that have G's, and ones that have C's. What's that got to do with what we're looking at here, particularly population genetics? Well, let's have a look. Um, in the ATAR notes, ATAR notes are worth getting a, a look at too because I think they provide some nice summaries of, of a lot of the key points. And Wainwright says that a single nucleotide polymorphism is a change of a single nucleotide at a specific position on the genome. This may be a substitution, changing an A to a G for example, an insertion, adding a new nucleotide, or a deletion, removing a nucleotide. I probably should mention at this point that we're starting to creep across into some of the content that we're going to develop in a little bit more detail in Module 6, uh, where we do look at mutation, we, we do look at changes in the DNA code and the consequences of those changes. But for reasons best known to others and not me, um, this has been put in here, and so we are going to kind of um, jump uh, a little bit backwards and forwards now um, in some of our discussions around population genetics and maybe a slightly deeper look at some aspects of DNA structure and change um, that we'll develop again a little bit later. But it's probably not a bad thing now to just to um, like let it wash over you a little bit um, and then come back and pick up some of those things that uh, you need a little bit more detail on as we go further on. So let's have a look. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to, I guess, understand that we've got um, two strands in our DNA. We tend to, to concentrate on one of those strands as having the template for um, the um, replication process and also for the protein synthesis process and obviously the protein synthesis process is the critical one that's what that genetic code is doing it's coding for the expression of a particular protein and the thing is that the code is read as a series of uh, triplets as a series of three bases so here you can see I've got G C and A as my first triplet or my first three that are going to produce my uh, mRNA codon. And we know that that's the opposite of each of these two. So if the mRNA code is going to be produced from this, we're going to have a C, we're going to have a G, and we would have a T, but we know that in, M, uh, in RNA we don't have Ts, instead we have Us. 
So what about the next one? Well, the next one along in the original one is an A and then a C and then a G. But you can actually see that in that position, in the A position for the next triplet, we have a change occurring. So everything that's coming after this point is still identical in terms of the code that's going to be read. But in this position here, we have a single nucleotide polymorphism. We have what is called a substitution. So a substitution just means one nucleotide's been shifted for another. So a nucleotide with an A base has been substituted for a G base or for a T base. If we know where this particular gene is or what this particular gene codes for or even specifically where the amino acid that's being um, coded for in the um, transfer RNA transferring that uh, amino acid onto the growing protein and we can get a little bit of an idea about what the genetic code may be for different individuals. And this is what happens when we're looking at using single nucleotide polymorphisms for population genetics. One of the problems is we can't see genes. We can't see what's actually in the DNA. We can kind of take cells out and start to map those, but that's still a fairly expensive process at the moment. So still what we try and do is we try and see if there are any ways that we can get to this information uh, more quickly. The quickest way is through identification of the expression of a protein. If we can see that the, the protein that's expressed is slightly different in terms of the constituent amino acids, hopefully that doesn't uh, destroy the protein's function, um, then that's one of the quickest ways. As you realize in a minute though, that's not the easiest thing for us to do with SNPs. But just to, co just to cover these other couple, obviously um, substitution is just one type of um, single nucleotide polymorphism, a change at a single base point. Uh, we often call these points the locus, a specific point that we know where something is happening. Uh, now, if the A was completely removed, then we would have something which we call a deletion. And obviously this is actually going to shift the whole thing because if I leave the A in and I have three, three, three moving along. Once I've taken the A out, the next three are actually going to, from this point further on, change the whole of those triplets of those um, codons that are going to come from the DNA. So there's going to be quite a significant change in the expression of a gene with this, with this sort of thing with a deletion. And the same is true of a an insertion. So instead, um, we would shunt everything across, say, with the addition of, even if I just put in another A, the A moves the A across. It now becomes part of yet another triplet, um, which again is going to shunt the um, whole sequence after that. So the consequence of insertions and deletions are much greater than those of substitutions, at least potentially much greater than those of substitutions, because they're actually moving the um, triplets one way or another. What we're after is SNPs that can act as genetic markers, places where we know, because our biggest problem is most of the time for the SNPs that we look at, they are part of non-coding DNA. And I kind of allude to to this a moment earlier. If we are able to see the um, code, see the expression of the DNA code through the formation of a protein, that makes it much easier for us to identify any changes that are occurring. If the DNA is non-coding, that is it's not going to produce uh, a, a, a protein, if it's an intron, for example, even if it's within a particular gene but it's not actually being expressed, then it's much more difficult for us to get to that information. We now need to target that section of that um, gene more specifically. We estimate there are around 10 million SNPs in the human genome, so there's a lot of them, and that's one of the reasons this is actually a useful tool in population genetics, because these random uh, mutations that are occurring, changes that are occurring in the genetic code, um, usually not direct result of mutations, usually something else that's happening, um, but they allow us to 
um, track individuals, look at populations, look at variations, um, as we did in the previous example, but just with some specific, more specific information on that code. So a couple of important implications. Firstly, um, for an SN, I guess the difference between an SNP and just a standard mutation is for the SNP to be useful, it needs to be in at least 1% or around that sort of uh, order of magnitude in the population. If it isn't, then it's just too rare and uh, it may well just be a, a, an individual mutation and that's not really very helpful to us because there's too many things we've got to compare it with. Um, what we do want to... Um, I guess, understand is that more than 90% of the differences across the human populations can actually be tracked through these SMPs. So there is actually a way for us to be able to do some specific identification, and we're going to talk about um, some of the implications of that a little bit later on in uh, the next video or so. They occur on all chromosomes and they average about one in 300. So that's actually why there's potentially 10 million because there's so much information in there and uh, because they occur on a reasonably regular basis. And as I mentioned, they are most common with the non-coding DNA or with introns, sections that are not expressing a protein. So that makes it a little bit more difficult for us to actually just directly identify some of these. Now this is a way of giving you a little bit of a look at the sort of information that comes up. Now, obviously there's no way we would expect you to understand or follow this through, but hopefully what you see is firstly we've got some um, chromosome mapping. So we can see different chromosomes, we can see genes that are identified on different chromosomes, and then we can look at the actual sequence themselves. So you can see here is the so you can see here is the actual sequence of bases. And what's identified through here are some of these substitutions, so where a particular base has been substituted for another base. There are also places of insertion, and there are places of deletion. And if you go on to this website, which is a, um, an American website, but it's got a huge amount of information, don't spend too long there or you'll get uh, lost in everything. Um, but, but a great site, a really fantastic, one of these databases um, that we're building all the time in genetics. By building these on computers, we have that massive computational power that allows lots of things to be done in very short periods of time and therefore um, questions that we can ask that we can get answers to in terms of variations in the genetic code. We'll have a look in classes, a couple of examples of how we actually apply our knowledge of SNPs, but hopefully this gives you a good introduction to the uh, whole concept of single nucleotide polymorphisms and the implications in population genetics. Thanks for watching.